Well, Jim, this next email was sent to cornydrivethrough at gmail.com from Eric Ford. My friend Mike Eskew's uncle Bobby Guy recently passed away. Okay, what now? You lost me around a far turn. What? What is this relationship? My friend, Mike Eskew, his uncle, Bobby Guy, passed away. Okay, wasn't he a blues guitarist? That's Buddy Guy. Buddy Guy. The great Buddy Guy. I knew a friend of mine who actually went to a Buddy Guy concert and went to the urinal, and all of a sudden, next to him was Buddy Guy with the guitar still in his hand, taking a <laughs> piss in the middle of the set. But anyway, Mike is not a listener but is a longtime fan of yours and has given me permission to pass this story along. We had always heard a tale growing up in Wynn, Arkansas. Wynn, Arkansas. Of his uncle Bobby's wrestling career as Batlin Bobby Guy, but we had never seen any evidence of it. Mike ran across this pretty cool artifact, and I thought you would get a kick oh. out of it. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I've, I've seen this. Now I know where you're going. I've seen this. I got the email too. Oh, okay. Nick Goulas was obviously not a fan of Outlaw Mud Show bullshit, <laughs> but this proves he was willing to give a fella a chance. Bobby Guy went on to work for Outlaw promoter Henry Rogers in Missouri and Arkansas off and on throughout the 70s. Side note, Mike's dad was the half Filipino wrestler for an Outlaw promotion in East Texas as Great Kabuki 2. <laughs> we always get a laugh out of that. And I have a note here. Let me see if I can zoom this in a little bit. It is on the Goulas Welch Wrestling Enterprises letterhead, Nashville, Tennessee, February 19th, 1972. Jim, let me read this and get your thoughts on it. Friend Bobby, we received your letter. First, the name Bobby Guy is not a professional name and doesn't sound good. By you wrestling for Henry Rogers and Aubrey Griffith, we do not know them as promoters and booking offices. <laughs> However... Hey, well, wait, a, wait a minute, let me just say also, Henry Rogers was a guy that ran Malden, Missouri. That's where Eddie Gilbert started. Eddie Gilbert started there, Kenny Wayne started there. A lot of the guys, before they were 18, they couldn't get a license in Tennessee. A lot of guys who would end up going on to, and this was in the mid-70s, going on to the Tennessee Territory would get a little bit of experience in Malden, but it was a very small-time thing with local guys wrestling that the people around town knew, and it was just there in that town, that little small town. And Aubrey Griffith was the guy that ran Little Outlaw shows in West Memphis, Arkansas, that was the first one that booked Jerry Lawler when he was plugging their matches on his radio show he had when he was in college, and that's when Fargo said, don't plug them, plug Nick's matches, and got him booked for Nick Goulas in, in Memphis, Tennessee, not West Memphis, Arkansas. So, so what that's you, who those promoters were. Well, what do you take? I'll stop right here and ask you this part. What do you think of the line, we do not know them as promoters and booking offices? <laughs> yeah, well, it's like, it, it was Nick's weird verbiage he used to use, uh, say, we don't recognize them as, you know, being fucking legitimate. They're outlaws. So your experience with them matters not to us. However, we will give you a chance and see what you can do. As soon as you receive this letter, call me at once. We can use you Friday, February 25th, and Saturday, <laughs> February 26th. Be here at the office by noon Friday. Once again, please call me as soon as you receive this letter, awaiting to hear from you, we remain, as ever, yours in sports, <laughs> Nick Goulas. And it says Nick Goulas and Roy Welch, but it's Nick Goulas' signature. Yes, and, and I saw, and now I'm trying, I'm looking at the email that that he, he sent it to me and to the uh, drive through email, and I had the picture of the letter, and now it just says image zero dot JPEG, and I can't click on it. I don't know what the fuck, but... Oh, that Goulas. Well, that's the thing is... um. It's also what is the uh, the secretary the little secretary line? Oh, hold on, let me go back on the left hand side. It's Nina NG, Bond. NG and then R W N H B. N H B would be Nina Bond. N H yeah, uh, Nick Goulas and then Nina Bond was the uh, the secretary that typed it. Um, and that's the that's the way they would communicate in those days. You know the. The wrestler or whoever it was would send pictures to the office with a letter, please book me. 
And I guarantee you, Nick's probably bringing his fucking guy in. Okay, I got a a fucking spot on Friday and Saturday. It was probably Friday night, some spot show, and then Saturday night they're going to beat him on TV. Because he'd never seen this guy before, so he's probably, okay, I got a, a fresh, warm body that nobody's seen coming in to do a job on TV Saturday morning. But but yeah, that's the way that they used to do things. Do you think he ever would have actually given one of these outlaw guys a chance? Well, actually, some outlaw guys did eventually turn at Troy Graham. Oh, I mean, yeah. not necessarily yeah. Nick. I'm not saying Nick gave it, but uh, some outlaw guys every once in a while would turn out to be something. Some, like Eddie Gilbert, because he was Tommy Gilbert's son, or Ken Wayne, because he was Buddy Wayne's son, they sent him over there because they couldn't get a license in Tennessee yet. So get some experience in front of a few people. But if you go through the history of outlaw promotions, Bobby Fulton. Bobby Fulton's first match was outlaw as fuck. His first couple of years in wrestling was outlaw as fuck. He was only 16 years old. But, you know, some guys then would persevere, would learn, get better, get a break. You A lot of times, if a guy was working outlaw in a particular territory, he would never get booked straight into you know, the the recognized territory, Lawler was an exception. Lawler's been an exception all his life. You'd have to go somewhere else and work for a, a established promoter and maybe get some experience there and then get booked back into your home territory, not directly from it. But it could happen if a guy was good enough and, and stuck around and tried hard enough. A lot of guys did outlaws in the early days, but not... It It was a whole different thing Nobody outside of Malden, Missouri, knew that there was wrestling matches in Malden, Missouri, featuring these people that lived in Malden, Missouri. But so Nick it knew. wasn't Nick knew because they you knew when anybody was running in your geographic area where you had television and were running regular shows, you as a wrestling promoter knew. But the wrestling fans, there was no publicity, there was no internet. So a lot of these outlaw shows, they were only an annoyance or a hindrance to the particular promoter that ran that territory. And the wrestling fans didn't know they were going on if they were a hundred miles away. And none of the other promoters in the business had even heard of these fucking people. So when you say working outlaw and now everybody knows wherever you're working, but back then, unless you, unless you got a reputation for being someone who, had established yourself as kind of a name in the business, but then was working against the established promoters and working outlaw shows, trying to draw them money. Then you'd get blackballed some jack off jerking the curtain on first, uh, like Nick here. He didn't give a fuck. Otherwise to say, I don't know who you are. I'll take a look at you, but we don't think much of that outlaw mud show bullshit up here. So you only got blackballed if you were, a name or in, in, in the, on the wrong side of a promotional war, you'd have to go somewhere else where it wasn't a problem to that promoter. And he wasn't a friend of the promoter you'd been fucking working against. And then he might get another chance. 